Good morning, folks. Good to have you back with us today. Today, I'd like for us to take a review of our previous pastor's tips for trying times. And I'm, I want to go through these just one by one, just in case you missed some of them, reinforce some of them, or maybe you're just new to it and let you know what we've done so far. Also, in case I forget to say this later, um, I will post um, to the Facebook page a document that has all of this on it. So you can just print it and hold on to it or fill up your trash can, whatever you want to do with it, or just don't do anything with it. But I do want you to have it. So the first thing we looked at was creation. And we pointed out a few things about creation. Just want you to know that the devil has no creative power. The devil can make things, he can mimic things, but the devil, as far as I can tell, has no creative power. In other words, he can take something or bring something out of nothing. Only God can do that. We call that ex nihilo, something out of nothing. So because he can't do that, you look at like this coronavirus, and you have to just know that this is God's work. This is not you know, something of Satan, but even Satan himself is a pawn of God. So just know that God is aware, God knows what's going on, and Satan did not do this, God allowed it. Just like in the book of Job, what came upon Job, God allowed. Now let me say something else about that. There's a new theory of the last couple of decades out that tries to bring together man's responsibility and, and his accountability to God and God's sovereignty and things, and it's called open theism or open theology. And in order to reconcile, you know, God knowing and man not knowing, the idea is largely that God doesn't know the future. And so because he doesn't know the future, he doesn't control it, essentially. So he doesn't know what man's going to do or what man's not going to do. Well, I just can't reconcile that with the Bible. It doesn't fit my understanding of theology. And so because that's the case, we I believe God is in control of all this. So, But what he does do is use things like this for his purposes. Just like the plagues of Egypt, uh, Job's sufferings that he went through, the sufferings that the apostles went through, the sufferings that Jesus went through, the sufferings that we'll end up seeing the church go through in the book of the Revelation. So just there's great confidence in knowing that God is in control. He's overseeing all this. No matter how it affects me or us, this is still God being in control because he's the creator. He made this. He allowed it the whole nine yards. So there's comfort in that. And God does that for a variety of reasons. Sometimes he does it to get man's attention. Sometimes he does it to discipline man. Sometimes he does things like that to try men's faith, to see where they are standing, that kind of thing. So the first thing we want to remember is that God is in control. He created this virus. He owns it. It's his. It'll do what he wants it to do. Nothing more, nothing less. And that'll affect the way we pray about it as well. Secondly, hope versus fear. And that really kind of ties into the creation. Because we know God made it, again, I, I can have hope and, and not be fearful, okay? Now, God does expect us to be fearful. Uh, the Bible is very clear about man fearing God. And, but that fear is not because he's a bad dad that comes home in a drunken stupor and beats everybody. That's not the kind of fear. There's a reverential respect knowing that he is in control. He does everything for his good. So we, because of that, I know that he can bring calamity on me or he can bring blessing upon me. So the Bible's very clear about us being, having a, a right kind of fear of, uh, of God. But at the same time, as First Timothy, excuse me, Second Timothy one seven says that God has not given us a, a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self control. So I'm 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 reverent towards God. I have a fear of Him, and yet I can come to the throne boldly. Um, I, I'm given a spirit, God, the Holy Spirit, in me, knowing that I can trust Him. 
what he's doing is, is good and right, and my trusting that is very helpful. God loves and has love for those who fear him, those who love him, those obey, who obey him. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, John said, There is no fear in love, but perfect or mature love casts out fear. So even in a trying time, a tribulation, a difficult time, even if it costs me dearly, might even cost me my life, I, having a reverence towards God, can face that knowing that he's doing good for me. One of my favorite verses literally for decades now has been found in the book of Job where Job said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And then he said, But I will maintain my ways before him. I will do right before him. And if he sees fit to kill me, he's God. Okay? That gives hope. So let's give way to hope, which God has given us, and the right kind of fear, but not live out and fear. Then thirdly is provision. I'm reminded I was telling um, I was telling God this morning in prayer that that Jesus says that a good father um, doesn't give his children a stone or a scorpion, but he gives good things to his children. But sometimes his view of good and what I see of good may not be the same thing. I might want as a ten year old a twelve gauge shotgun. But a good dad says, you're not ready for a 12-gauge shotgun. At least most people aren't, okay? But you get the idea, okay? But God does provide for us. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, Peter says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the precious promises that... Through these, you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Have you noticed that in Peter's declaration of God giving us all these things, he didn't say, I'm going to give you a boat, um, a new snowmobile, a bigger house, and all these kinds of things that we have a tendency to think of as God's blessing upon us. God gives us things that are far more important than the, the physical things of this life, though he does give us the physical things. But again, I would go back up to the hope versus fear. If God sees it's best for me to die for his honor and glory, isn't that a good thing? I would suggest it is. If God gives me grace and strength and patience through trial and tribulation, isn't that a good thing? And let's face it, in eternity, the value of those things will be far greater than any of the snowmobiles or the material possessions that, uh, you know, rust corrupts and, and, and moths eat up, okay? So, God does provide for us the things that we really need, okay? Fourthly, we looked at activity, and this is physical exercise. Get out and do something. You know, we're a couple weeks into this thing. We're probably starting to feel it more and more, the tension, the anxiety, the stress, you know, not only personally because you're not out as much, but also familially. You know, you've got the kids running around. They're getting stir crazy. There's a variety of things that are going on now that we're not accustomed to and as creatures of habit, you know, that affects us. So in 1 Timothy 4, 8, uh, Paul says to Timothy, for while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and for the life to come. Okay, So you say, well, that's not very um, um, promoting towards physical activity. No, it's, it's a promotion for spiritual activity. But it is a concession that there is value to physical activity. Folks, there's a lot of things you can do to stay active. And there's reasons why you should stay active. Number one, if you're not active, it's going to create more stress on you. If you're not active, it's going to make your days go by longer. If you're not active, you're going to probably gain weight and get just in, in, in less good shape because you're not burning the calories. And you probably have a tendency to eat more out of boredom or things like that. So if you create some kind of structured routine that you can get out and actually do something, it's going to help you in a lot of ways. 
it's going to help you if you get your kids engaged in doing something because they're going to benefit in the same kinds of ways. And, and as far as the virus is concerned, look, if you're in better shape, probably your body's going to repel it a little bit better. I'm not a doctor. Don't take that medicinally. I'm just saying that you know, it just makes probably pretty good sense. Beachbody.com right now has 14 days you know, free trial on their uh, on-demand stuff. You do that with your spouse and you do it yourself. You got a month for free. There's a variety of things, a thousand apps out there. If nothing else, get down and do some push-ups. If you're older and you can't do what you used to could do, that doesn't mean you get to just sit in the chair and lay around and do nothing all the time. Do something. It's just going to be overall better for you in a thousand ways, okay? Then fifthly, we looked at God's sovereignty. And sovereignty simply means that God is in control. He oversees all this stuff. Nothing's happening that he's not aware of. And the example we used last week, and probably my favorite example, because it just really blows my mind and it transcends me, I hate it, but I'm grateful for it, is in Acts chapter 2, verses 23 and 24, says, This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and the foreknowledge of God. You crucified, talking about the Jewish people, and killed by the hands of lawless men, that same Jesus, God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Okay, So the greatest tragedy in all of existence was God the, the Son dying, a, living a perfect life, and then dying at the hands of sinful men. Nothing could be more tragic than that. And yet, God was in control of that. God used that. And if you're a converted person, you've benefited by that. So don't think because there's a trying time that it's out of God's control and that it can't be beneficial. Hello. Because it can be beneficial and God will ensure that it is. You know, we like to use uh, Romans 8, 28 all the time when things are going good. All things work together for good to them who love God, who is called according to his purpose. Well, number one, most people take that out out of context usually because you really got to start up at verse 26 and go all the way down to verse 29 because God's doing all these things so that we'll be increasingly conformed to the image of his dear son. Does that mean that God uses only successful soccer championships and only when I get that new job with better pay for his honor and glory? No, it means that God can even use tragedy and trial and, and even death for his honor and glory. If that's what makes me be increasingly conformed to the image of Jesus, that's a good thing, okay? So God is sovereign over all this stuff, and he uses it for his goodwill. Again, I'll go back to Job. Job is one of the kind of books that you probably dismiss. You don't think much of it until the bottom falls out in your world. And when it does, the, the book of Job is the place you want to go to because it'll resonate with you like most books don't. And like uh, it probably never has before. So if you're in a trying time right now, I strongly encourage you to go to the book of Job. It is, it is just fantastic. It's a wonderful, wonderful book. Okay? So we looked at his sovereignty. Then we looked, uh, number six, at prayer. Now, prayer, quite honestly, is a simple spiritual discipline. It's something that we should be doing all the time. It should be a regular part of your life. Okay? And, and, and if it's not, I understand that. Prayer is hard. In its simple definition, it's, it's not hard at all. It's just talking like I'm talking to you now. All right? But somehow, speaking to God can be a very um, difficult thing. And there's a reason for that. We are broken people in a broken world communicating with a perfect and holy God. There's a, there's a, a disconnect there. All right? Prayer is work. It's work because it's spiritual warfare. This is where the two realms are coming together. There's always tension in them, but when we come together with God, there, there, there's, there, there's peace there, there's comfort there, there's encouragement there. And, and we could go on and on about prayer, but I just want to encourage you to simply pray. In, in Proverbs chapter 15, verse 8, the Proverbs says, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is acceptable him, to him. Um, 
I think the King James says God delights in it, and that's the idea of acceptable. God, crazily enough, God enjoys our prayer, even when it's difficult. And, and it is spiritual warfare. If you think not, go back and read Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane at the end of his earthly ministry, and you'll see the importance of prayer as well as the difficulty of prayer there. So who do you pray for? Well, on a personal level, um, I would say, uh, before you get to the people, find a place to pray. Make sure that your heart is ready to pray, given to prayer. You're not being distracted by other things, whether they be externally or internally. You know, in ensure that you really are in a mode of prayer, if you will, okay? So do that. What about who I pray to? Well, you, there's the personal side, you, your needs, whatever the case might be. But there's also a ministerial side. There are people who need you to be praying for them. Um, let's take, for example, again, the coronavirus thing. Our tendency is to pray very selfishly, and that's, that can be good. The selfish side says, God, make this thing go away. Uh, please don't let anybody die. Please don't let me get it. Please don't let my family members get it. And, and that's understandable because we, we're selfish people and we think what's good for me is really what's good for me. But how about your will be done? How about, Lord, if you want me to have it for some reason, let your will be done. So pray for God's will first and foremost. There's ministry there. Pray ministerially also for other people. Lord, protect my family and friends. I'm praying that for my children. My daughter's in China, okay? Um, but I don't want her to come back unless it's the Lord's will. You know, she might be strategically placed there. If the bottom falls out in the world, I would love little more than for my daughter to be able to do something monumental for the kingdom of God in, in, in maybe the last days or this trying time, whatever the case might be. But ministerially, obviously pray for yourself. Pray for your family. Pray for lost loved ones. God can use this whole issue to draw men to himself. God often uses calamity, trial, war, famine, pestilence to draw men to himself to get their attention. Let's face it. Don't we all typically turn to God when the bottom falls out? You know, we live our life like everything's going good and we're happy and we don't really need God. But as soon as the bottom falls out, as soon as we lose our job, as soon as there's a tragedy, oh God. I'm not despising that. I'm just saying that's the way it is, and God can use that. He oftentimes does use that. So be um, ready to find a place to and, and give yourself to genuine prayer. Then seventh, we looked at ministering, ministering to other people. How can I minister to other people? Well, you can do it by prayer. You can do it by uh, helping people out. Maybe you have a vehicle and they need a ride. Maybe you have finances and they need a few bucks. You know, there's a lot of ways. We see the world doing that now. Um, they're, they're feeding the doctors and the nurses. People are coming together to do a lot of philanthropic and um, benevolent things. And all that's good, okay? But if the world's going to do that, how much more ought the Christian church do that? So I want to encourage you to look for ways that you can minister to other people. Again, you can call people, maybe some shut-ins, the elderly. You can text them. You can FaceTime them. You can do a variety of things. Quite honestly, these pastor's tips are an effort to provide some kind of ministry to primarily our people at Hunter's Creek, but to anybody else that might need it. So it takes my time, but that's fine. That's what I'm here for, and if it helps you, well, again, that's what, that's what this is all designed to do. So let's look for ways to minister. And remember, ministry is a verb. It's an action word, okay? Then we looked at reading. And reading is a big deal. Um, read something. But when you read, read profitably. In other words, don't waste your time on junk. Life's too short to waste your time reading stuff that just really doesn't matter. For example, in Revelation chapter 1, in verse 3, it says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. Now, if that was written 1900 plus years ago, 
How much nearer is our salvation, to put it in another biblical term, than when we believed? Okay? If that's the case, and, and let's just say, and this we'll say more about this next week. Let's just say that this is the end or the beginning of the end. Are you ready? I mean, are, are, have you prepared yourself for what could be the end? And I'm not saying this. I'm not a sensational person, and I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm just not that way. But at the same time, there is going to come a day that is going to be the end times. Okay? So the more I can understand about God's Word uh, by reading it and hearing it and understanding it, Maybe the better prepared I'll be for whenever that time is. Maybe I'll be more discerning. Maybe I'll be more receptive to it, whatever the case might be. So read and start with the Bible. You don't have to just read the Bible, but if you only ever read just the Bible, that would be fine too. There are other good things out there. I suggested to you the other day, Pilgrim's Progress. It's an allegory. If you haven't picked up a copy yet, please do. You can get it on your Kindle or your iPad, ebook, whatever. There's a lot of ways to get it. You don't actually have to have the physical book. There's a reason why it's an almost 400-year-old Christian classic, and you would do well, trust me, trust me, trust me, to read Pilgrim's Progress. You might want to read Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis, another excellent book. If it's not already considered a classic, it will be considered a classic. Thing is, there's, there's a lot of really good books out there to read, and I want to encourage you to read, 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 okay? Um, in, in Proverbs 2.2, I'm going through the Proverbs every month right now for this year. In Proverbs 2.2, the writer of Proverbs Proverb said, Making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding. I want you to take note of two particular words there. My ear does not do what it wants to do. My ear does what I want it to do. If I want to turn it to the one way or turn it away from somebody else, like I make it do. If I want to shut it, I shut it. If I want to pull on it, I pull on it. If I want to stop it up, I stop it up. But I do that. So when the Bible says make your ear attentive, what does it mean? It means make your heart cause your ear to listen. And, and, and there's a metaphor there for the word, listening to what the Bible says, because the Bible doesn't just jump up and talk to me. I read it, it so there's that the, the idea of receiving through my ear gate what God has written down that I'm receiving from my eye gate. And the same thing goes on when he finishes out that text. He says, um, inclining your heart. There's another verb. There's an action word. There's, there's, there's work being involved there. In other words, it takes effort. So when we read the Bible, let's be careful that we don't just, you know, pick it up and get our nine chapters a day in, shut it and say, got that done. No, it's better to read a little and get something than to read a lot and get nothing. Let your heart, let your ear be inclined to God's word. Ask God to bless it as you're reading it and just ask him to cause you to assimilate it, to keep it, to share it, to live it, to be it for other people and for yourself. There's really a lot of good reasons to read, starting with the Bible, and there's a lot of good books to read out there. Ebooks typically are easier, less expensive. You don't have to go out and get them. You don't have to receive them from Amazon, so there's no concern about um, coronavirus being on them or anything like that. So you'll see there's just a lot of things that we've gone through. Today, I just want to review these things, challenge you, encourage you, remind you. But again, I'll put these out on our Facebook page, the Hunters Creek Community Church um, public page, not the group page. That's a private page. And you can download them and hold on to them, whatever you want to do. Okay. But either way, these are just hopefully some tips to help you manage through this time. There's a lot that could be added to what I'm saying. And please forgive me for taking so long even at doing it this way. Okay. Lord bless you. Have a good day. And, and let me just remind you this. Just because we are not able to gather corporately, Sunday is still the Lord's day. Sunday, as the Lord's day, is the day where we, we worship God in a corporate fashion. But just because we don't come together to worship corporately doesn't mean that, oh, no, I can't worship. Oh, you can. My encouragement to you Treat the Lord's Day just like you would if you were going to drive to the church, sit in a pew, and listen to the preacher, okay? 
Condition your heart and your mind to be ready to worship when we come on, Lord willing, at 11 a.m. Give yourself to it. Hear, think, be, be engaged. Don't think, oh no, I think I can go get you know a pop out of the refrigerator or let me run to the restroom or let me you know go spank the kids whatever it is you do okay my encouragement to you is true to treat it as much like if you were in the assembly hall together with your brothers and your sisters as you can that's one of the reasons why we have it uh, you know the, the video coming with within the church so you can see the, the building back there trying to make it as normal as possible okay but please Worship on the Lord's day, just like if you would if you were here, okay? Well, bless you, Lord willing. We'll see you Sunday morning at 11 a.m. on the Hunter's Creek page, and see you then. Bye-bye.